Okay. I'm going to tell you another story now. So you're blessed. Okay. Now I need you to be focused. You need to listen. And like I said in the first service, if anyone falls asleep in my sermon, I'm watching. And I'm going to come down and slap you in the name of Jesus. All right? But not children, because there's a law against that. All right? All right. There's a story about a guy called Albert. You've got to follow with me. It might not not necessarily be a true story, it doesn't matter. There's always a reason. It might not be a good reason, but anyway, let's get to that. Story about a guy called Albert. He's 99 years old, and he's in a hospital bed, and he's in a coma. But there on the end of his bed is his wife, his partner, his friend of 99 years, Hazel. And out of some miracle, Albert wakes up. And as his eyes focus, he looks at Hazel and he said, Hazel, do you remember when we were 10 years old and I rode my bicycle down that great hill, my chain fell off, I hit the tree at the bottom and broke my arms and legs, concussion and ribs. She said, she said, I was there, Albert. She said, that's right, you were there. You were there, Hazel. Hazel. You, went, you ran and got old Doc Bagley to come and fix me up. You were there. He said, do you remember when we were 15 years old and we were sitting on grandma's porch and my faithful Labrador of 10 years just got up, right out of character, run in front of that truck, splat, dead. You were there. She said, that's right, Albert, I was there. I remember you were upset for a week. That's right, you were there. He said, do you remember when we were 20 years old and we were sitting on that same seat and those men in uniform came up the path, told me I had to go to that great war. You were there. Yeah, I was there. I remember how upset your family was. Do you remember when that grenade went off and it blew the bottom of my leg off and I had shrapnel through my body? And little did I know that after I'd signed up, you would join the nurses' corps and when I woke up in that field hospital, you were there. That's right, I was there. I remember the pain and agony you were in, but I nursed you back to health. Yeah, you were there. He said, do you remember when we were 40? And I finally had the courage to ask you to marry me. And I wanted to be romantic, so I hired the paddle steamer. And just before I could say I do, the boat sank. (laughs) You were there. She said, that's right, Albert. You couldn't swim. You nearly drowned. I had to drag you to shore. You were there. He said, do you remember when we were 60? And I finally had enough money to buy that one bedroom, one bathroom house on the corner of that little property. And just on the day we went to move in, that great fire came through and destroyed everything. You were there. She said, that's right, Albert, I was there. Now listen close. And then with all his strength, Albert gets up on one elbow and he pulls the tubes out of his nose and the electrodes off his chest and he said, Hazel, your bad luck. Uh, You have no idea how hard it is to tell a story like that. Okay. There's a good reason. There's a good reason why I told that story. And, uh, well, a reason anyway. Laughter is good medicine, right? Doesn't the Bible say that? So it's okay to laugh in church? You won't go to hell for that. (laughs) So what was the reason? Okay, the reason is, maybe I'm preparing you for fire and brimstone that's about to rain down. Who knows? The reason I told you that story is it's not about luck or in some cases bad luck that you've arrived in church today. You you might come, this might be your first time attending a church, just having a look. You might have been invited by a friend, you might come here as you do most weeks to worship the Lord. But it's not about luck or bad luck. You see today for everyone sitting in this room, it's a divine appointment not between you and I or each other, a divine appointment between you and God. And I want to ask you to ask yourself a question today. And to some, this is going to offend, okay? So get over that. I want you to ask yourself, and I'm I'm not going to pick on any individual, I want everyone to ask this question of themselves. Do I truly believe in Jesus Christ? Do I believe who he said He said he was. Did he really die for my sins? And have I accepted him as my saviour? Or, on the flip side, do I choose not to believe in Jesus Christ? It's a lot of baloney, a fairy tale. 
Two choices, pretty easy, but very, 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 very important. You see, God in his divine wisdom has given us a free will to choose or not to choose. I would love to make that decision for you, but I'm not allowed to. And you know what? I, I wouldn't want to carry that burden. The decision to follow Jesus Christ or choose not to follow Jesus Christ is yours. And we're going to, I want you to think about that, if you can, throughout the service. Now, it's been a few years since I've had the opportunity to preach in my home church. Uh, perhaps the elders have thought it's, oh, enough time has passed that you've all recovered from the last one. Uh, I don't know. But some great things have come out of my preparation. One is my prayer life has gone through the roof. My gosh, I've got calluses on my knees from praying so much. I don't think God cares. He probably thinks I'm a bit silly on my knees. I could sit down. My prayer life has gone through the roof. The scriptures, I've read the scriptures from cover to cover and back again. And it's been such an awesome journey. And thirdly, you know what? My appreciation for Pastor Ryan has gone through the roof. Pastor Ryan gets up here every week. Every, and we give him a day off, that's fine. He's just good enough, yeah. So you know what? We need to be keeping them in our prayers, don't we? Never forget that. In preparation, I search for a hidden gem that I want to share with the church today. You know, there is no book of sermons. I can't just grab number 327 and get up here and pull my glasses over my nose and read it out. That would be awful. That would be a travesty. The scriptures should jump out at you. The scriptures should cut to the hearts of men and women and children. They should grab a person and turn them 180 degrees. They should challenge. They should offend. And in preparation for this, I was reminded, I'm, I'm over 60 years old now. I know it's hard to believe, right? Handsome young guy like me, yeah. I'm over 60 years old, but when I gave my life to Christ at 30 or 29, 28, whenever it was, uh, when I was 30, I was allowed, in, in fact, in this church here, was my very first time I, 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 was, I was given the opportunity to preach. And I was so influenced by people I had read about in my early informative years as a Christian. And one of the guys that I loved was a guy long since passed away called Charles Haddon Spurgeon. He was known as the preacher of preachers. Tens of thousands of people came to Christ in his ministry. Hundreds and hundreds of pastors were taught by Charles Haddon Spurgeon. When he died, London shut down and the streets were filled from one side to the other. A, 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 a procession meant for royalty was this humble pastor. He would have thought, what's all the fuss? But in, in a message to his students, his student pastors, he said, how dare I inflict, he uses that word, how dare I inflict a message on God's people unless that message has cut him to the heart Unless he believed the Holy Spirit had grabbed him and turned him inside out, then he had no right to inflict that message on the, minister, on, on, on the congregation. He would never get up on a Sunday morning and fill in a gap. In fact, he said, shame on him if he ever preached six anecdotes for healthy living and neglected Christ crucified. And as a young guy being influenced by that, I've always locked myself away in the hope of finding that hidden gem. But just by way of confession, I need to get this off my chest because I've got the mic, I can do that. By way of confession, what I do at my place is I, I, we've got a little loft in our house and I lock myself up there and I have my Bible in one hand, a notebook in the other and a cup of coffee in the other and an iPad in the other. <laughs> and I pace up and down, up and down and I pray and I write notes, but something bizarre happened. And I'm going to sound like an absolute fruitcake, I get that. And if I'm a fool for Christ, then so be it, right? What happened as I was praying, I kept coming back to this parable called the parable of the sower, and many of you will know it well. So immediately in my prayer, I said, Lord, not that one. Not that one. And I went and prayed and studied again. Uh, but every time I referenced, I kept coming back to this rotten parable of the sower. And I said, Lord, there is no way, as long as my backside points south, and by, will I be preaching on the parable of the sower, you're going to have to find me something else. Well, after a week of this ridiculous dialogue, I finally tore up my notes and sat down. 
And, and I honestly, I said, Lord, I don't even know what you're trying to tell me. I don't get it. So I opened up the parable afresh, and I read, and I read it, and I tell you, by the third time as I read it, some words illuminated off the page that cut me right to the heart. And I knew that I had to share that today. So after that great introduction, you're going to think, well, what's he talking about? Anyway. So anyway, if, you've, if you haven't been around church for a while, Jesus spoke in parables. Now, a parable is a simple story. It's an illustration. And he would share these illustrations, these stories, not just with his disciples, but with a wide audience. The people in that audience would be the disciples, the followers, the seekers, the critics, the cynics, the teachers of the law, the Pharisees, the Sadducees, those that were there trying to trap him by his words. He would speak to a large audience, but he would speak in parables so that those who had ears to hear could hear. And the interesting thing about this parable is that, uh, if you can imagine, the Bible says there's, there's, there's a whole bunch of people, it doesn't say a number, but there's, the, the, the crowds are gathering around him. Now, if I took this mic off and stood in the centre of the church and tried to talk to you, there would be always someone behind me, right? So I'd get dizzy and you guys wouldn't hear. So what Jesus does, something clever, he jumps in a boat, pushes off 10, 20, 30 metres, the Bible doesn't say, parks his boat and his voice projects across the water as they all gather on the shore edge, maybe the Sea of Galilee, some lake. Okay, so you get the picture. So let's pick it up in the book of Mark, chapter 4, verse 9. Here we go. Again, Jesus began to teach by the lake. The crowd that gathered around him was so large that he got into a boat and sat, sat in it, out in the lake while the other people stood along the shore at the water's edge. I didn't make that up, did I? It's here. He taught them many things in parables. And in his teaching, he said, listen, this is the key word today, church. Listen. A farmer went out to sow his seed. As he was scattering the seed, some fell along the path. And the birds came and ate it all up. Some fell on rocky places where it didn't have much soil. It sprang up quickly, but because the soil was shallow, but when the sun came up, the plants were scorched. And they withered because they had no root. Other seed fell among the thorns, which grew up, but then they, they choked the plants so that they didn't bear any grain. Still other seed fell on good soil. It came up, grew and produced a crop, some multiplying 30, some 60, some even 100 times. Then Jesus said, for those who have ears to hear, let them hear. Do you know that phrase, for those who have ears to hear, let them hear? That wasn't even a phrase of Jesus. That phrase was first spoken by the prophet Ezekiel, some 600 years before Jesus Christ. And Jesus would often seed and weave those words of the, of the prophets within his conversations. In fact, as we look through all the scriptures, you'll see that phrase said over and over again. Let's keep going. Verse 10. When he was alone, the twelve and the others around him asked him about the parable. He told them, the secret, the secret of the kingdom of God has been given to you. Let me say that again. The secret of the kingdom of God has been given to you. But to those on the outside, everything is said in parables so that they may, may be ever seeing but never perceiving, ever hearing but never understanding. Otherwise, they might turn and be forgiven. Turn where? Turn to God. Be forgiven for what? For the sin that so chokes them and tangles them and sends them on the wrong direction. The secret of the kingdom of God has been given to you. Now, I want you to put yourself in a position at the disciples' feet right now. Can you imagine being one of the disciples? When Jesus said to you, I'm going to tell you something, the secret of the kingdom of God has been given to you. Do you think they would have been sitting there saying, wow, how good is this? Do you know what? They would have said, what secret? They didn't know the question, let alone the answer. They had no idea. What's Jesus talking about? Rocks and weeds and stones and birds and seed. They had no idea. He's a tough teacher. Listen to what he says in verse 13. Then Jesus said to them, Don't you understand this parable? How then will you understand any parable? Jesus is some tough teacher, isn't he? What secret? We're going to read his explanation in a moment. But hidden within this explanation, I believe, is the secret. 
That's brave words, right? The term the word, or word, is said eight times in seven verses. Eight times in seven... Don't try to count them. Take my word for it. Eight times in seven verses. Let's read it. Let's read it again. Mm. Sorry, yep, okay. Did we read the explanation yet? No, we didn't. Here it is, okay. Already in slip. Verse 14. The farmer sows the word. Some people are like seed along the path where the word is sown. As soon as they hear it, Satan, our adversary, comes along and takes away the word that was sown in them. Others, like seed on rocky places, hear the word, and at once they receive it with joy. But since they have no root, they only last a short time. When trouble or persecution comes because of the word, they quickly fall away. Still others, like seed sown among the thorns, hear the word, but the worries of life, the deceitfulness of wealth, and the desires for other things come in and choke the word, making it unfruitful. Others, like seed sown on good soil, they hear the word, accept it, and produce a crop, some 30, some 60, some 100 times what was sown. Even after Jesus explained the parable, did they really understand it? I ask you to focus on that term, the word. But you know what? This Bible we hold here, what do we, what do we call this Bible? The Word. God's Word. The Holy Word. The Word of God. And rightly so. And it's very convenient for us to take that scripture, the parable of the sower, and change that word to the Bible. Because it sort of fits. It's a bit convenient. But does it explain the secret to the kingdom of God. Now this is where it gets dangerous and I need you, I need you to bear with me. I need you to forgive me. We're in a place of forgiveness, right? The church. So listen. We're going to read that again. But this time, wherever you see the word, I want you to replace it with the term Jesus Christ. Okay? Whenever you see the word, Jesus. Let's read it again. The farmer sows the word. Some people are like seed along the path where the word is sown. As soon as they hear it, Satan comes and takes away the word that was sown in them. Others like seed on rocky places hear the word and at once they receive it with joy. But since they have no root, they only last a short time. When trouble or persecution comes because of the word, they quickly fall away. Still seed like sown among thorns, hear the word, but the worries of life, the deceitfulness of wealth and the desire of other things come in and choke the word, Jesus. Others like seed sown on good soil, hear the word, accept it, produce a crop, some 30, some 60, some 100 times what was sown. Pretty brave thing to change the what you might think is the meaning. But turn with me to the book of John 1, chapter 1. Not my words, the words of the scriptures. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was with God in the beginning, and through him all things were made. Without him nothing was made that has been made. In him was life, and that life was the light of all mankind. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness has not overcome it. There was a man sent from God, and his name was John. John the Baptist he's talking about now. He came as a witness to testify concerning that light, so that through him all might believe. He himself was not the light. He came only as a witness to the light. The true light that gives light to everyone was coming into the world. He was in the world, and though the world was made through him, the world did not recognize him. 
He came to that which was his own, but his own did not receive him. Yet to all who did receive him, to those who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God, children born of not natural descent, nor of a human decision or a husband's will, but born of God. Verse 14, a key verse. The word became flesh, and he made his dwelling among us. We have seen his glory, the glory of the one and only who came from the Father, full of grace and truth. Friends, the word is Jesus Christ. And Jesus Christ is the secret to the kingdom of God. You know, at the time, at the time this, uh, this, this discussion was had with his disciples, the Bible didn't exist. This didn't come about to the 5th century. This actual story, the book of Mark, the gospel of Mark, wasn't written until 40 years after Jesus had died. So I feel good about inserting Jesus in the word, the living word. The word is Jesus Christ. The secret to the kingdom of God is Jesus Christ. There's a discussion between the disciple Peter and Jesus, and Peter makes a proud boast, a proud boast. He said, Jesus, I will lay down my life for you. Pretty brave, hey? I will lay down my life for you. You know, Jesus looked at him and said, no, you won't, Peter. I tell you the truth. Before the rooster crows, you will deny me three times. You will deny me. And that came to pass when Jesus needed him most. He said, I don't even know the man. I don't even know him. But Jesus doesn't get bitter and twisted. In fact, he encourages his disciples. This is what he says. John 14, 1 to 6. Do not let your hearts be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. My father's house has many rooms. If that were not so, would I have told you that I'm going to prepare a place for you? And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come back. I will come back and take you to be with me that you also may be where I am. You know the place where I am going. And Thomas said to him, I love his honesty, Lord, we don't know where you're going. How can we know the way? Jesus answered, I am the way. I am the way, the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. The word is Jesus Christ. The secret, is the kingdom of, the secret of the kingdom of God is Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ is the only way to the Father. In preparation for today, I was reminded this week of a painting by a guy called Holman Hunt. Uh, I don't know what he's famous for, but in this painting, there's a picture of a garden setting with a door, an arched door. There's weeds and roots growing up around it. And the interesting thing, this door doesn't have a handle on it. And the caption under this painting of Holman Hunt, very famous, very clever, it says, here I am. I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come in and eat with him and him with me. That scripture is out of the book of Revelation, John's book of Revelation. And often over the years, that very painting has been used in formats like this. For someone who has never met Jesus Christ to have the courage to open the door if you hear his voice. But the context of that scripture is much deeper. In the book of Revelation, John is giving the seven churches of Asia Minor a rebuke. He's telling them to come back to God, to turn back to God and repent. He's talking to the whole church not just individuals, and the church is made up of many, right? Let me read the whole scripture to you from the book of Revelation. These are the words of the Amen, Jesus Christ, the faithful and true witness, the ruler of God's creation. I know your deeds, that you are neither cold nor hot. I wish you were either one or the other. So because you are lukewarm, neither hot nor cold, I'm about to spit you out of my mouth. This is tough, right? You say I am rich, I've acquired wealth and don't need a thing. 
but you don't realise that you are wretched, pitiful, poor, blind and naked. I counsel you to buy from me gold refined in the fire so you can become rich and white clothes to wear so you can cover your shameful nakedness and salve to put on your eyes so you can see. You know, this is also a picture, an echo of the parable of the sower, of the weeds choking up the deceitfulness of wealth, etc., etc. Those whom I love, I rebuke and I discipline. So be earnest and repent. And verse 20, the caption. Here I am, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, there's a choice. I will come in and eat with him and him with me. To the one who is victorious, I will give the right to sit with me on my throne, just as I was victorious and sat down with my father on his throne. Verse 22, you've heard it a few times already. Whoever has ears to hear, let them hear what the Spirit says to the churches. Whoever has ears to hear, let the Spirit, let the Spirit, what the Spirit says to the churches. If you want to be victorious in Jesus Christ, then friends, you've got to walk forward and open the door. Jesus will not belt that door down. He has given each one of us a free will. The secret of the kingdom of God is Jesus Christ. In a few moments, we're going to take communion. For those of you who haven't been around church for a while, communion, we keep some emblems on each one of these desks, tables. The, the, the biscuit that represents the body of Christ, the juice that represents his blood. On the night Jesus was betrayed, he, broke the, he was betrayed. On the night he was betrayed, that blows me away. On the night he was betrayed, he broke the bread and he said, this is my body, broken for you. When you eat it, would you remember me? In the same way, he took the cup and he said, this is my blood, poured out for you. Whenever you drink it, would you remember me? I'm going to invite you to get up at your leisure. Go and take some of the emblems, the biscuit and the juice, and, and come back and sit down, and we'll eat and drink together. The parable of the sower is much more than a clever illustration about the growth or lack of growth in a church. It's more than about receiving and falling away. It's more than about receiving and not following through. It's more than re being just receiving and then being choked by life's worries. It's so significant that Jesus told his disciples the secret of the kingdom of God has been given to you. Jesus never used his words lightly. This secret, Jesus Christ, has been given to you today. What we hold in our hands, the bread that represents his body and the juice which represents his blood, you hold in your hands the secret to the kingdom of God, the keys to heaven, so to speak, but the decision is yours. And I want to echo those words, has been given to you. We can't earn the love of Jesus Christ. He gave it to us, not because we deserved it, not because we're any better than anyone else, because he loved us so much that he would sacrifice his son, Jesus Christ. The secret of the kingdom of God has been given to you. Let's eat and drink and remember the body and blood of Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. You thought I'd forgotten, but I haven't. I ask you to ask yourself a question at the beginning of the service. Do I choose to believe in Jesus Christ? Do I choose that? Do I choose to believe that he died and on the third day he rose again? Do I believe that he took my sin to the cross? Or do I choose not to believe? I didn't pick any individual. I'm speaking to the whole church. If anyone here has allowed those weeds of life to come and choke Jesus out, then I'm calling you to open the door if you heard his voice. For those who have never met Jesus Christ, 
I invite you to open the door and let him in. The choice is yours. Let me pray. Father, we come before you today and Lord, acknowledge Jesus, Lord, crucified, yet rose again for the forgiveness of my sin. Lord, and I don't know the minds of all your people, but I prayed in the name of Jesus for those who, were, who, who had ears to hear your voice above mine. So Lord, if you have spoken to any individual today, then Lord, give them the courage to step forward and open the door and invite you in. And I give thanks in the mighty name of Jesus Christ. Amen.